officially starting yet. Uh, I was just wanting to warm up a little bit. I had a few questions for the audience. Did any of y'all watch the movie, the uh, three-part movie? Yes. Of you did. It's great. It's, a, it's kind of a Hollywood version of, uh, of the movie or of the events. So it's not really something I want to address tonight as far as uh, the actual timeline of the movie. Has, has anybody been down the, to where Dev Lines is buried at down on Sarian there? I'll tell you my little story uh, where I went down there the other day. But <clears throat> back about a week and a half, two weeks ago, I went down to, uh, down to Sarian. I was actually on my way down uh, at Stock below the courthouse to take some of the depots back. I was on my way down to Welch. And, uh, I haven't been down through there in quite a while, down where Del Lance is buried up there and where, uh, where he's, uh, it's it's been, like, it's been quite a while since I've, I've been down through there, but it was right on one of the really hot days, it's oh, yeah. about 94, 95 degrees, and I was like, well, I'm just going to stop there since I'm on the way down down the Welch to take the deep woods down there also. And so I pull over and right when I pull over, there's two other cars pull over. And I was like, oh, I'll probably have company if we're going up on the hill here. But one, one of the uh, car loads of uh, folks was uh, from South Carolina. And the other car load was from New York. <laughs> so I was like, my goodness, they're off the beaten path here. And I'm sure they, they probably thought that after they come down the load and then went down 44 there toward, toward Gilbert. And they're having the sticks here. And then, but, uh, so we got out and, and uh, they looked and they saw my little state badge and they're like, uh, does the state maintain this cemetery? And I'm like, no, the cemetery is a private cemetery, it's a family cemetery and there's no perpetual care or anything. So, but you're free to go on up there and, and as long as you don't get over on the guy that's on the right hand side there, he has some animals and things. And, uh, so we all kind of walking up the hill and all together there's 12 or 13 of us. And uh, it was hot as can be. And uh, they said, well, can you tell us anything about this? And I said, yeah, I believe I can. <laughs> and so, uh, so we got to walk all over the cemetery there. It's, uh, if you've never been to the cemetery, it's up on the hillside, just like most of the cemeteries here in West Virginia. There very, very few flatland cemeteries in West Virginia here is in case. Come on in, I'm just warming up here. The, uh, you know, the, the cemetery is pretty steep, and as you go up the road, it's about, about a 75 yards up, up to where uh, Dev Lance is buried. And along with his children, there's uh, several of his children are buried there. The son, son of uh, Eli and Troy is buried to the left of him there at Tennis. And uh, Tennis is up to his right. Rosie's uh, buried right behind him and where Mike is buried at. And uh, it's a pretty pretty rough climb, a pretty pretty rough walk up to there. It's a little winding road. And if you have a four-wheel drive, you can probably get up there, but a car you're just, just not gonna be able to. So if you plan on going down there, just make sure you wear some shoes that give you a little grip as you come up the hill there. We'll kind of wait and, wait and give some more people a chance to come in. Um, I <clears throat> You'll notice right here at the top, there at the uh, front of the room, uh, on the table, but uh, right there in front of me, there's uh, some documents that we have. Once the uh, presentation is over and things, uh, you're free to come up and take a look at them. I'll try to explain why I uh, marked some of the papers for uh, I've taken some of the lecture material from. The, uh, the archives has quite a collection as far as, as uh, the Logan County books. That came from the uh, circuit clerk's office. And we have on microfilm as far as the, uh, a lot of the census records, a lot of the old chancellor 
temporary records and that we have a lot as far as the loan utility is concerned. The, uh, of course, we have the census on, on, the, on the part of that. We also have a, uh, a website that if you're interested in looking at some of our, uh, you can come on in. The, uh, we have a website that also has a, the list of a lot of these manuscripts and things uh, that uh, we do have in the collections. The, uh, uh, off the top of my head here, some of the things that we do have. Of course, a lot of those, a lot of those are in the databases as far as the list of the manuscripts and things. So that you can look through and kind of get a, an idea if you're coming down. You don't have a whole lot of time to do research. You can kind of get an idea of things that you want to look at and jot them down. And the librarians will be able to go ahead and call them from the stacks for you. On the uh, ends of the uh, tables there, there's uh, some hand handouts that I had created as far as the uh, the, uh, the timeline of the feud, and then on the back of it is the map from Otis uh, Rice's book, The Hatfields and the McCoys. Uh, I printed probably about 70 of them out. Um, it's just a, a, a kind of a rough outline as far as the actual feud of in 1882. 1888. <laughs> the, uh, which I wanted, I wanted to kind of pass on a little something. <clears throat> the reason why I had asked about if you had seen the movie or the documentary that was on the day or so after the movie, or the series, <clears throat> the, uh, this timeline, Those are the events of the few that I was kind of, kind of going to avoid actually going through the, the blood and shooting part of the few, which in all actuality there was not a whole lot of, of deaths from this, probably about 12, as best I can tell. And as far as the people that were involved in it, there wasn't a, a, a large amount of people. This feud was not really like the feud that was going on over in Kentucky at the time. There were several that was happening over in Bradley County, uh, Martin Hargis, kind of trying to remember them off the top of my head, but there were several feuds that was going on over in Kentucky at this time that I, I would not really consider them feuds, I would consider them wars, because when you have 100 to 200 men running around in the streets of the town shooting at each other, that's more of a war than a feud. But they do, they do call them feuds. It's a little bit, a little bit more toward the war side, I, I, I've got this feeling. But this is just a, a real quick little little timeline as far and like I mentioned, what I, what I planned on doing is actually looking at the uh, background and some of the information on what I feel is one of the causative factors uh, leading up to the view. <coughs> and uh, some of the people that was that was involved in it as far as some of the shooting part of it and some of the probably the talking part of it, and then one of Devil Lance's friends and the spiritual advisor. And then later on, I uh, talked a little bit about uh, Devil Lance himself and some of the things he was involved in. I'll go over that here a little bit more than I think everybody comes in here. Some pictures and things in there. Uh, 
uh, there's some pictures and things in there that is very interesting. Then uh, there's some of the books, some of the popular books that was actually from, from some of the more of the mainstream, <coughs> what's the mainstream media? Uh, Crawford's book, uh, American Vendetta. And that's another uh, thing that I'd uh, like to mention as far as the pictures and things. On our website, there is a, uh, a uh, portion of uh, one of the links that you can click on that is uh, the Hatfield. There's a bunch of the Hatfield and pictures and also the Coy pictures. That's one thing I, as far as the uh, some of the things I want to talk about tonight, you'll notice that there's not a whole lot of McCoys in there. We are in West Virginia, so we'll kind of stay to the pet uh, side of the thing. <coughs> side. <coughs> and after uh, I was looking at the earlier, some of y'all were looking at the map that's on the back of the map from the last few hours. One thing you'll notice on this map is if you look at it, where May 1 is, it's a six, six mile circumference around May 1. That's where most of this action takes place. It's a very compact area. The, uh, the distance over to the uh, Randolph McCoy's uh, cabin and the distance to Devil Manson's cabin is, is not, not really great. It's, it's pretty close. The uh, a lot of these events are they're, they're really close to May One. May One's kind of one of those places where kind of forest gump kind of thing. Things happen around May One, and as we've seen throughout history, we've, we've noticed that about May One. There, in the Hatfield McCoy view, and then later on, the uh, the events uh, Sid Hatfield and the uh, another Hatfield there. Um, but, um, you know, May 1 is one of the kind of places where, where a lot of things happen, historical things. The uh, railroad coming through, it's one of the little towns that was incorporated. Uh, it's one of the kind of little places where things happen. Uh, also on that map, you'll notice as far as the place names, Cape Blackberry Branch, that is uh, just right across from uh, from uh, Maitlon, actually right beside the bus curb on the Kentucky side, which the election was just right up from the mouth of that, that branch. Okay, there's the Blackberry branch, and then over on the other side of the hill is Blackberry Fork Pond Creek. So there's just a little bit of the terminology as part of the place name placement there. We may have a few more people come in, but I would like to uh, welcome you all to the Tuesday night lecture program that's hosted by the West Virginia Archives and History Library. This is something that we uh, think has been quite successful and our topics have been very interesting for the people that have been able to hear them. Uh, I'd like to make an, an announcement or two with upcoming uh, programs. This Thursday, July 12, Mary Glass will discuss searching the 1940 census and getting the most out of FamilySearch.org. That should be a very nice presentation. A lot of people have had their 
frustrations with the 1940 census. On August 7th, Jeff Pearson, who is the director of the art section here of the Division of Culture and History, he will speak about artists from West Virginia. And on August 9th, our own Susan Scorus, way back there, <laughs> will talk about West Virginia cookbooks. Now that should be a bit interesting. All of our lectures and workshops can be viewed on our YouTube site, which is accessible from our webpage. We've had a lot of requests for people that couldn't make some of these uh, presentations that they was really upset that they might not get to see it, but uh, they are on YouTube, so that is a good thing. Okay, tonight our speaker is familiar to our staff because he is one of us. Randy Markham has lived most of his life in West Virginia. His family has lived in the Tuck River Valley since the early 1800s. He is a graduate of the University of Rio Grande in Rio Grande, Ohio, and presently works at the West Virginia Archives and History Library, where he assists in county records preservation for the Records Man Management and Preservation Board. Randy and Cal Campbell. Cal, I think, is in attendance. He needs to wave and let you see who he is. They are currently involved in a project creating microfilm of every deed recorded in West Virginia and in the process are creating digital images that are given to the counties to be loaded into their existing software systems to enhance accessibility. Randy's hobbies include motorcycle riding, woodworking, and West Virginia history. He is the current president of the Wayne County Genealogical and Historical Society. Tonight, Randy will speak on the Hatfield and McCoy feud, which is a very popular topic due to the recent miniseries. His primary focus will be on some lesser known characters associated which, with the few, and we've been looking forward to this presentation for some time. It is, it is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Randy Markham. give a description of what, what I'm going to cover tonight in the lecture, uh, time for many. The life and death of uh, Abner Vance is going to be the first portion of the, of the lecture. Then three, three persons that are associated with you there, it's going to be Valentine Hatfield, William Dyke Garrett, and Alexander Nasser. And then the, the uh, third portion of the uh, lecture is going to be some of the court proceedings, land transactions, and a, a look at the timber operations that Del Wance was involved in. Some of the sources that I, I've used to, uh, to, that I've read to help put together some of this is Altina Waller's book, The Hatfields, McCoys, and Social Change in Appalachia. Uh, Otis K. Rice's book, which that's the map that's on the uh, back of the handout here, The Hatfields and the McCoys. Coleman C. Hatfields and uh, Robert Spence's The Tell of the Devil. Virgil Jones' uh, 
the Hatfields and McCoys. And then as you can see, uh, some of the uh, Logan County uh, Circuit Clerk's uh, books and also used uh, the deed books of Logan County itself. Also, I'd like to mention that the portion on Abner Vance was, a lot of the research was done by Barbara Cherrick. She is a, a Vance researcher. This first portion, The Life and Hanging of Abner Vance. And this is one of those events. Many people view the feud as starting with the Civil War with Asa uh, McCoy. The I don't I don't know how, how valid that would be because there there's uh, there was so much bushwhacking going on and things at that point that he was probably just another person who got killed there. But I think if you go back and this is going back quite a, quite a ways uh, in the 18, 18 teens, Abner Vance is, is one of those. Uh, one of those events that I think affects the mindset of people as when people look back and, and they see what, what has went on with their family and things. I think that this is one of the events, the life and hanging of uh, Abner Vance. This does, this does happen quite a ways before the feud. And this is kind of the genealogy, but I want to talk a little bit on something before uh, or uh, um, talk about the genealogy. I often think, what was Valentine Hatfield, Devil Ants, some of his other brothers, probably Eli's, some of their sons as they were walking up uh, a warm holler that night that uh, Ellison Hatfield was laying dying. And I often wonder what, what some of the things they could have been thinking about or some of the things that they would have been talking about. And I. I can't help from thinking that maybe that this was one of the things that they were talking about that night. They were talking about their, uh, which in this case we can see, James Vance. <coughs> James Vance is, uh, is, the, uh, is the grandson of Abner Vance, and uh, Doug Wentz Hatfield is the great-grandson of Abner Vance. The, uh, I, I can't help but thinking that maybe they were discussing what had happened in the life of, of Abner Vance and how justice had, had played out in the hanging of, of Abner Vance. And I, that may be one thing that they were thinking as they were walking up uh, Warren Holler, or they had walked up to where the McCoy boys were being held at Nate Creek, and they were discussing the, the, the life and what had happened that had caused the uh, Abner Vance to be hung that night, or that, that day back in 1880. Yeah, there's two, there's two stories as far as Abner Vance goes. There's one that the, that the family had uh, brought down through time, and then there's one that is concerned with the uh, court records. Okay, I'll tell you the, uh, the uh, story of Abner Vance from the family's perspective. This may have been, may have been what uh, the Hatfields were discussing that night, some of their family. Jim Vance wasn't involved in the, in the three McCoy boys dying that, that night, but, but some of the, uh, with the Hatfields there, this may have been the, that story, that family story that they were, were thinking about. The, uh, Abner Vance was a farmer down in uh, Russell County, uh, Virginia. He had uh, he lived down there for quite a while. His family had traveled across uh, across Virginia. They were part of that Western movement. They had traveled over, and, and at this time they were living over in Russell County, Virginia. And this is the family story now. He had lived there along the Clinch River, and um, you know, had a very large family, and, and uh, he had a uh, wayward daughter, Elizabeth. Now, the, uh, the family story runs along these lines in that 
the Morgans were another family that was down in, in Virginia, and they uh, they were quite powerful. They had, they were involved politically in, in the county of Russell, in the uh, county government there in Russell County, and um, this daughter had uh, rode away with uh, one of the Morgan brothers, uh, Daniel Morgan, and. Later on, when uh, Daniel brought her back, <coughs> and, uh, he pushed her off the horse and said, uh, here's your cow back. Of course, he was very, very angry at that point. And as, uh, as he turns and ride, rides away, his brother Lewis is with him. And uh, uh, Abner Vance uh, loads his rifle. And as they're riding away, he takes aim and he shoots Lewis, probably accidentally. But he shoots Lewis and uh, Lewis tumbles off of his horse and falls into the Clinch River. And he's saved at that point, but he dies uh, several days later. And Abner Vance is charged with, uh, with uh, the murder of uh, Lewis Horton. But Lewis Horton, his family is, is very powerful in the county of Russell, so when they have the trial, there's uh, some false statements made, and, and uh, Abner Vance is, is convicted of murder, and he's hung there. And the, uh, now that's, that's the family story part of it, where uh, the, uh, the death of, of uh, Abner, they, they attribute that to uh, false, uh, false statements by the wardens and several other witnesses. And he was hung because of false statements made in court against him. <coughs> now, the court, the court part of this that uh, has been researched by Barbara Charity. And uh, okay, the, there was uh, Abner Vance. On the 22nd of September, 1817, Lewis Horton was shot by Abner Vance. And he died later on September 27th, 1817. The, uh, about six days before that, six days before uh, September 22nd, there was a uh, hearing in the Chancellery Court there in Russell County. And statements were given and during the hearing that one of the statements apparently uh, Abner Vance felt threatened by. And as the way he put it was, he, he had, things had been sworn on his life. And at that point, you can take them as kind of a threat, like this is, well, a threat from, from uh, Daniel Morgan. It could have possibly been a land, land thing. We're not really sure because a lot of those records that actually deal, detail that part of the case in the Chancery Court and the deposition is not existent, unfortunately. But in the later court, court records, he, he felt that he had been threatened uh, some way during his uh, deposition. But we don't know what that deposition was about. But Chancery Courts at that time handled land, they handled wills, they handled divorces, and they handled bastard cases. And so, there may be a connection that has come down through time to, to the family that, that that may be that connection. We're, we're not really sure as far as, as far as what it was exactly over. The, uh, on the 16th of October at that point, in 1817, the, uh, they had a hearing to indict uh, Abner Vance on and also his wife, Susanna, was also indicted. I want to read some of this because it's pretty complex as far. Well. A hearing was held for the indictment on the charge of murder against both Abner and Susanna Vance. It's pretty obvious at that point what had happened. Uh, Abner had shot Lewis Horton and Lewis Horton had died. He was not given a bill and Susanna was unable to post the bell amount. It was several thousand dollars and so she was not going to be able to come up with that amount. 
The, uh, on November 4, 1817, a hearing was held as to whether Richard Bench should be charged with accessory after the fact to murder. It was determined that he should be, and he was remanded to jail. On the next day, he was given the opportunity to push bail, which he did. His charge was not quite as, as serious as what Abner and Suzanne was. On April 18, 1818, Abner was brought to trial. He pled not guilty, and the, his trial commenced. The next day, charges against Susanna was, was dropped, and she was released from jail. On the following day, charges was dropped against the son Richard. You'll notice on the uh, genealogy chart there, Richard is, is one, of the, one of the sons. He had, had a, a large amount of sons and daughters. Jim Vance being a grandson. Uh, was Dev Lance being a, a great grandson. And just to give you an idea as far as uh, Jim Vance. These uh, gentlemen uh, on the slide here, this is Dev Lance. And this is Jim Vance. That's his uncle Jim, the one they referred to as Uncle Jim. <clears throat> I'll explain the slide here in just a little bit. There's actually two parts to the slide. Finally, on April the on the seventh, excuse me, on the seventeenth, Abner was convicted of murder in the first degree. His sentence to be hung on July 17, 1818. However, three exceptions was filed. We know two of these exceptions was the uh, that dealt with with his defense, his uh, insanity. He pled insanity, which insanity is not not in the case of insanity nowadays, but insanity as in the heat of the moment type insanity. And the uh, and the other. Uh, the other exception was uh, the judge had made uh, biased statements during the trial. He had published some things in one of the local newspapers, which I'll read in just a minute. The uh, judge was uh, Peter Johnston. The, uh, at, at that point, Abner Vance is still in jail. His wife is, is, has been out of jail. She was charged was dropped against her and things. But with these exceptions and things, Abner Vance was granted a new trial. The, uh, they looked at all the evidence and things said, okay, we'll go with a new trial for, for Abner. <coughs> the new trial began on September 14th with Judge Johnson as the presiding judge again. Nowadays that would probably not be done that way. <laughs> Each day that the, the, uh, the trial was called to order, they were having a problem though. In, the, in Russell County, the, they were unable to find jurors to sit as a jury. Throughout this whole process, the, uh, the sheriff would go out each day, bring in several people. They would sit there and the, the prosecution and the defense would go through these jurors and say, no, we, we don't want that one, no, we don't want that one. So they were unable to see the jury. And that was, by the end of the term, they had not been unable to see the jury because it, either everybody knew uh, Abner Vance or there was, the prosecution was like, hey, that, that, that person, that, that gentleman is, is too well too well known to Abner, we're afraid, we're afraid that he'll go against our trial or our uh, case here. One thing you may not be able to read now. This is from an old newspaper, The American Beacon. It's an article regarding uh, Abner Vance. The, uh, and basically, it's, it's talking about this at the end of that first trial, the exceptions and things, and, and the you know, some of the, the case facts and things. And I decided to kind of point out this part of it. This is a, this is a, a little blurb on the Sylvania, uh, it says, it looks like Broward, but it's Brewer. And uh, this family is, uh, this family is from the same area 
That is what the Hatfields and the Vances moved to eventually. They're part of this movement also, Western. And um, you'll notice this, this little portion here is, is actually not about uh, Abner Vance, but I thought it was, it was interesting as far as some of the reporting and things. We'll see this later in other newspapers during the feud as far as how they did some of the reporting. But he was then lost into eternity when he was hung. The, uh, <clears throat> each day the trial was called to order, unable to see. Altogether, about 64 persons was, was uh, interviewed for, for jury duty, unable to see the jury. So the trial was put off until the next term of court. During all this time, Abner Vance is in prison. The family part of it was that he had had taken off and was up in Logan County during all this time and that his son Richard was like, Dad, you ought to go back to Russell County and get this settled. It's, it's bothering your conscience and things. You, know, you ought to go back and, and get this settled. But according to the, the court documents, that, that's not, not exactly true on that part of it. That he was actually in jail during this whole time and his health was failing, but that, that was one of the things they mentioned that he was in poor health uh, throughout this trial. <clears throat> So what does the judge do? At that point, he writes a letter to the House of Delegates over in Richmond. He says, we have a problem here in that we cannot get this case tried. And so the, uh, the uh, House of Delegates and well, the legislature itself goes ahead and they read this, this letter from Judge Johnson. <coughs> and so they decide that there's a change in state law they will do is they will grant a change of venue from here on from the county that is having a problem having a trial if the court from that county petitions then that trial will be changed to another county well that has that has some consequences for Abner Vance and, and, and what happened with him <coughs> Yeah, this, this change was in the revised code of, of 1819 there in Virginia. The, uh, so at that point, the trial was changed to Washington County. On May 31st, 1819, they started Abner Vance's trial. The next day, they found him guilty. And at that point, they, they pronounced, pronounced sentence on him that he would be hung. <coughs> That he would be hung by the neck. Um, that occurred on uh, July 16, 1819. So, <clears throat> the one thing throughout all this trial and things is that he is saying, and his defense is saying, there's false statements being made against me. The, the, uh, the uh, prosecutor is, is, is the false statements that that I had that I had not been threatened and things. There was there was false statements being made against him. Also, the uh, at that point he was challenging the whole change of venue part, where this this was a, a case that was already in progress, and all of a sudden they want to change the rules, and where they want to change it from the county of my home, where everybody knows me and, and, and things, they want to change it to, to a hostile county, and they did. And the end result was he was hung. Now, what was the mindset at that point that was created? I, I would sort of believe that Deb Wance and Valentine and and the others that that were uh, that were descendants of Abner Vance at that point, they're thinking, if we get in front of a, a judge, a hostile judge, things are going to be tough for us. Which we see that later on in, in 1888. But it does have some some uh, consequences initially when the three McCord boys 
had killed Elson Hatfield. He dies after a couple days. And at that point, I'm sure that the Hatfields were sitting there saying, these boys go back to, to Kentucky. Are we going to see justice? We've seen where justice has not been applied years before, and it affected our family quite a bit. You know, is justice going to be applied in this case? And I think they made a decision there that, you know, it's not going to be made, or there's justice is not going to be granted, and we're going to do something about it. And it had fatal consequences for the three McCord boys. <coughs> I would like to point out that the Vance family, right shortly after his hanging, these, uh, the census records was from about June of 1820. This was within, within several months of Abner Vance being hung. His family continues that Western movement, and by that time they're up in Logan County, which if you'll notice, it says 1880, uh, or 1820 U.S. Census for Cabell County and Barbersville, Virginia. At that time, Logan County didn't exist until several, a couple years later, uh, 1824. So at that point, there it's still called Cabell County down in that area. So they have already moved at that point from Russell County, where all this all this has occurred to their father. They've already moved by this time back up or on up into Cabell County to I think maybe to get a fresh start. It's a uh, Valentine Wall Hatfield. This is the brother of, uh, of Devil Ants Hatfield. A little bit older than Devil Ants. This is actually a drawing from, uh, from the newspaper. thing about, about, about Valentine is 
He was politically minded. The, uh, he'd been elected as a Justice of the Peace in Magnolia uh, District of Logan County, which Magnolia di District, if you, if you divide uh, Mingo County, what is now Mingo County, if you divide it into two, that southern portion of Mingo County is just about Magnolia District. The northern portion of, of Mingo County would have been Hardy District. That's an approximation, but it's pretty close as far as Magnolia is concerned. Okay, he was a, a Justice of the Peace until 1888 when he surrendered to Frank Phillips. So he, so he was he was he was involved in the law of Logan County for quite a while. 1870 to 1888. So he he kinda knew the law, knew his way around, had been the uh, the uh, President of the, of the court in the Logan County in 1879, had been uh, involved probably in a lot of the political the elections and things in, in that end of the, of the county. He had also served as a deputy sheriff in Logan County in 1883. Uh, probably was delivering summonses of some sort or maybe you know, collecting in something for the sheriff's department or something. But I'm going to show you some of the slides that are actual scans from uh, one of the collections that we have. The Secretary of State, we have the collections, and we have a lot of the old records from uh, that office. And these were a list of officers for, for Logan County. So this is actually when, when, uh, when Valentine was uh, elected as Justice of the Peace in 1870. This is the actual, in the uh, Logan County Commissioner's book. These are over 100 years old, but these are a list of officers for uh, Logan County in 1873. And what this would do is it would list each of the officers in each of the districts. There were several districts in Logan County, Magnolia being one of the party, uh, Tridelphia, uh, Logan, up in Chapman, Chapmanville area. And they would have, these lists would come to the uh, Secretary of State's office. And they would list who the Justice of the Peace was, who the Constable was, and several of the other political figures. Yeah, I can't believe these up. Uh, Valentine Hatfield. Post office address, uh, Mount Maypree. And the, uh, the other person that you see there, the name you see there, for the other Justice, is he from Hatfield. These guys were involved in politics quite a bit. He also, uh, right around the mouth of uh, Maple Creek, or of May Creek, you'll notice uh, one of the other election officials is uh, Ryan McCoy. So they were involved in some of the political, political offices here in Logan County also. Right here is Hardy County, or Hardy District of uh, Logan County. You'll notice that the uh, Notice that the Justice of the Peace is William Chapins. And that's another name that we're going around across whenever Devil Lance gets married. His wife's name is Vicey Chapin. So these are some ten books of Vicey. The name Chapins goes through a lot of people. There. The, uh, then there's some of the Evans family. There were another family that's prominent in this area. This is another list from 1883. Now this is, this is after Ellison Hatfield dies uh, and the three McCoy boys are executed. The notice right here, uh, Valentine Hatfield is the Justice of the Peace. Eli Hatfield is the constable for this district at this point. Of course, they are signed by the, the uh, uh, clerk of the county, John Chapin, another Chapin member. This is a uh, this is the actual entry for the uh, where he was uh, the uh, 
deputy sheriff, and he'll be qualified as a deputy sheriff. But also, there's an interesting name right here. John S. Markham and uh, George F. Ratliff were authorized to practice law in Logan County also. That, that is the name we'll come across again for the end of the lecture. <clears throat> Another, basically another list as far as uh, Valentine Hatfield, Justice of the Peace. Here's a <clears throat> Valentine Hatfield. Now, what happened in the feud with Valentine Hatfield? He, uh, he, uh, <clears throat> he surrendered to Frank Phillips in late January. He had the, uh, the uh, burning of the, uh, of the Randolph McCoy cabin on the 1st of January, 1888. Had the burning of the cabin. Randolph McCoy escapes. His son Calvin is killed. His daughter Alfair is killed also. The, uh, their cabins burned. They move over to Pike Pool at that point. The Valentine Hatfield, after after Jim Vance and, and Cap, Cap Hatfield are trying to get away from uh, Frank Phillips, you know, well, Jim Vance at this point is killed and uh, Cap Hatfield escapes. Well, several days later, uh, Valentine Hatfield, he uh, surrenders to uh, Frank Phillips with the understanding that, that he would not, not be taken into custody until just right before his, his trial. Of course, that, that went out the window immediately. He, Frank Phillips came over and, and captured him right off the bat. <clears throat> and at that point, there's a lot of uh, things going on with uh, Pike County politics also. Frank Phillips has been authorized, sort of a semi-official semi as far as the Kentucky government is concerned, to start, and this is where Perry Klein comes into this also, Perry Klein has started get, gaining power in uh, Pike County during this time. And he is, is uh, at this point, he's, Randolph McCoy has, has talked to him enough, and plus he was a kin, kinsman of uh, Randolph McCoy, but uh, the, uh, Perry Klein is starting to to make some waves. He's been uh, an official in Pike County for a little while. He's also been a delegate over to uh, Kentucky in the, uh, the uh, House of Delegates. And so he's, he's, he's a lawyer also. And so he's starting to, to make some problems for the Hatfields. And the response to this was the Hatfields, uh, the burning of uh, Randolph McCoy's cabin. And that sets off, at this point, that sets off all these uh, parades over in West Virginia where uh, Phillips and the posse is, is trying to catch these half builds and they're pretty successful at it. Uh, eventually, with uh, some of the things that went on as far as the, uh, the uh, private detective agencies and things, they managed to, to get in line with the uh, half builds and their supporters. <coughs> and they, one of the, the first things that they do, and this is shortly after, after Valentine is captured, surrenders himself, is they appeal a habeas corpus to the courts. In other words, they have taken me from my home, and that, which that is against the Constitution, and you're secure in your home. And at that point, the uh, Hatfields have all, there, there's, these cases have been filed to, uh, as far as habeas corpus goes, and they're wanting to be released back to their home since the, the government of Kentucky has, has taken them up against the, the law. Well, the, uh, they're in, in Louisville. The first thing they do is, is the judge says, this case has to go to the Supreme Court. So this case goes to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court rules on it. And the thing that they rule on is that, yes, these guys were taken, but they're in, they're in custody of the state of uh, Kentucky now, and they got there by private citizens and by other ways, and since they're there, then they can go ahead and be tried. 
So that's, at that point, that's what they do is they say, okay, government, the uh, government of Pike County says, okay, we can go ahead and try these guys. The Supreme Court says that so it's all right for the, us to go ahead and have these guys, and they go ahead and try them. <clears throat> okay. The trial of Valentine Hatfield, August of 1889. The, it's kind of strange when I, when I read some of this. Valentine's attorney for all this is Perry Klein. This is... This is the guy that, that Del Wentz had, had beat out his property, which he had beaten legally out of it. And this is the guy that's agitating for all the hat bills to be captured. Uh, Randolph McCoy has been, been you know, on him to, to do something about it, has been on to the prosecutor, Lee Ferguson over in, in uh, Pike County, been on him to, to do something about the hat bills. And lo and behold, their attorney is Perry Klein. How does, how does Perry Klein, or how does Valentine Hatfield afford Perry Klein? Well, Valentine Hatfield and uh, his three uh, son-in-laws, the Mahon brothers, the Mahon brothers, they agreed to put their property up over in West Virginia, over on Beach Creek and things. They agreed to put their property up for the legal fees for Perry Klein to, to represent them in the court of law. I guess at that point Perry thought maybe he would be able to get some of the property that the devil ends had, had got from him, or at least some of the half of his property. Yeah. It was very interesting in that, that uh, right after he was convicted of the murders of the three McCoy boys, he was sent to prison and he died about six months later in prison. Um, he was one of the ones that, that never did get out of prison. The other gentleman is, is Alexander Messer didn't get out of prison or in the way. The, uh, <clears throat> some of the statements that, that, um, that were the stereotypical statements that we hear as far as, as uh, we consider hillbillies and things that, that Valentine Hatfield made a statement to one of the, uh, one of the reporters I was interviewing because he was, he, he liked to talk to people and the, uh, the reporter asked him, he said, but I've, I've heard that you have several wives. And uh, Valentine Hatfield at that point is like, no, he said, I have only one. And that's all I would want to have. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, the other statement he made said, we have been tried, convicted, and sentenced by the press before they know the facts of our case. You will find us all different people from, from the general ideals that's been entertained by us. I think back of that, of uh, Crawford's book, uh, American Vendetta, and, and the portrayal that he gave of, of, of uh, Del White's Hatfield and, and some of the other Hatfield members and things. I, I, I think that kind of plays into it just a little bit there. I'd like to go on to the next question. We like Garrett. Garrett is a, <clears throat> was born on the December 10th, 1841, died May 28th, 1938, 97 years old. He, he lived quite a, quite a while. We were talking about him today. Uh, he saw everything from, uh, from the horse and buggy days all the way up to airplane. He, he lived quite a, quite a long time there. He was married to uh, Sarah Ann Smith. They got married uh, February 19, 1847. His military service, now he was a Confederate soldier. His military service was, uh, was 36th of Virginia Infantry Company B, known as the Logan Wildcats. Okay, now, when I talk, when I, as far as the Civil War part of, of a lot of this, he was a Confederate. A lot of his family was Union. Uh, he had, his uncles uh, lived up in Wayne County on the uh, 12 Pole Creek. Uh, Morgan Garrett was a uh, Union soldier. And uh, he, 
he had, he had been captured and uh, sent, been sent to a living prison over in, in Richmond. And, uh, <coughs> and um, the interesting thing about Morgan Garrett is after the Civil War, he's the sheriff of Wayne County. So there's, there's some political things as far as back and forth with Wayne County there. Uh, the Garretts were a family that was pretty large and they lived up in Wayne County and Logan County both. The, uh, the inter another interesting thing that, about Morgan Garrett is he was exchanged for uh, Charles Walk Walker Ferguson. This is the brother of uh, Milton Jameson Ferguson, uh, the, the colonel of the 16th Virginia Cavalry. Uh, William Dyke Garrett was uh, born on the Big Creek over in uh, Logan County. His family, actually his father had moved from Wayne County over into Logan County, just right around the Chapmanville area there. Um, that was the area that, that uh, Dyke Garrett, Uncle Dyke Garrett lived. That was another name for him, was Uncle Dyke Garrett. That was a, an area that he lived at for practically all his life. He's a uh, he enjoyed bear hunting with uh, with uh, Del Wentz Hatfield. Del Wentz, Del Wentz was really into bears. He really liked bears. Any anything that he was describing, which uh, one of the court cases later on, will talk about how Del Wentz described it as a kind of a bear hunt. The uh, <coughs> the uh, as I mentioned, uh, William Dyke Garrett, uh, Shepherd of the Hills, is another name that they called him by. And when we look at the spirituality of, of Uncle Dyke Garrett, you have to go back to Alexander Campbell to get an idea as far as, as some of his uh, religious thoughts and some of the religious ideals that came down to him. Alexander Campbell, of course, Bethany College here in the state, uh, the, uh, there was a movement in the 1820s far as the religious movements in the frontier areas, which would have been West Virginia, or what is now West Virginia, Kentucky, Virginia, and, and we had, uh, Alexander Campbell was one of the proponents of that, that reparation or reform movement that they had. The, uh, the, uh, one of the converts of Alexander Campbell was a fellow by the name of Alexander Lunsford. Alexander Lunsford was living over in uh, Saltsville, uh, Virginia, Washington County area, right around the same time as, born right around the same time as when Agnes Vance and those were over in that area. Alexander Lunsford, then, he moved, after the Civil War things, he moved over toward, toward the, um, at that point he was moving from Russell County over into Tazewell County. And then on over in the Logan County, about 1860, 1860, uh, to, uh, he was running for prosecuting attorney of Logan County, John Taylor. Well, one of the revivals that he's holding in 1868 <coughs> is uh, just uh, north of up toward uh, Chapmanville. And one of the guys that's sitting out in the audience jumps up and says, that's the gospel for me after he hears uh, Alexander Lunsford preaching, and that is William Dyke Garrett. William Dyke Garrett, at that point, he, uh, he begins preaching and things, which uh, is kind of a circuit preacher type, type individual. <coughs> Uncle Dyke Garrett begins preaching and things. Uh, then later on, as you'll notice on this slide here, uh, he's authorized uh, to celebrate marriages in Logan County. And this is one of the one of the things that was mentioned as far as the circuit court. He had, he had been preaching with, uh, with uh, Alexander Lunsford for quite a while. They'd been setting up many, many of the churches, many of the 
to call the Christian Church and the Church of Christ throughout Logan County and Clayton County and, and down to what is now known as Mingo County. Uh, that set up a lot of these churches and things. Well, later on, when Alexander Lunsford dies, uh, when, when that Garrett continues on with the preaching, and, and there's some men that he converts also, Green McNeely being one of them. And Green, Green McNeely is a helper to, to Mike Garrett here. And Later on, in about 1911, the uh, Dyke Garrett is an uh, announcement happens up close to Montgomery. And the two sons of, uh, of uh, Del Lance Hatfield and uh, Vicey, Ch Vicey Hatfield are killed in a uh, gunfight. No, well, kind of a gunfight. It's actually, they were, uh, they had a uh, business going on in that area where they were. Uh, they were providing alcohol, a lot of the mining camps and things, and they were they were one of well, their business was was selling alcohol, and a guy had had kind of horned in on their area there, and so they went and talked to the guy that was doing the the deliveries for them, and they were going to inform him that he was not to be in their area delivering alcohol, and so. He disagreed with them, and they had, they were, there was a shootout. The gentleman died that, uh, that, uh, that they had went and talked to. And of course, they were also shot during this. Uh, one of them died within 20 or 30 minutes. The other one died probably a couple hours later. Well, this letter here, or this uh, message is for uh, Doc Garrett and uh, Green Mc McNeely, asking them that they would come and preach the funeral, Del Lance had requested for them to come and preach uh, his son's funeral. And of course they did. The, uh, right after the, uh, within, within a couple of weeks of that, Del Lance himself was baptized by uh, Dyke Garrett. At that point, I'm sure that throughout the years, uh, uh, Dyke Garrett had probably been kind of wearing on on, uh, on Dead Lance, hey, you, you need to get your life in order, and you know, there's been some really bad things happen, and you know, is, there, is there something you're missing out, you're getting a little bit older here, you know, maybe you want to, to do something about your life. So at that point, Dead Lance uh, is, uh, is, is baptized by uh, Dyke Garrett, and and uh, Green McNeely. <clears throat> the little story that goes along with that is uh, on his way home, five years on his way back to uh, to his home over in um, on Crowley Creek, over in that area, and he stops at Scott McDonald's house. And Scott McDonald's is, is, uh, owns several pieces of property over in that area, and uh, his daughter is sitting there, and they uh, he says to the prayer room and the food and things, and, and uh, he leans over to the little girl, Molly McDonald, and says, Molly, I baptize the devil today. <laughs> <laughs> Later on, uh, Dyke Garrett and, uh, and uh, <coughs> Green McNeely uh, preached uh, devil answers funeral there in um, Savoy Sarah Ann on January 9th, 1921. And then he was buried up on that hill and right to bury Sarah Ann. <coughs> Alexander Messer. That's the only slide I have for you. Doesn't have any picture or anything. I haven't been able to find a thing on it. Alan Besser took it where he died in prison. That's about all I've been able to find on <clears throat> However, we do know a few things about him. He was born August 13, 1837 in Hazard, Perry County, Kentucky. Died June 24, 1923 at the Western State Hospital in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. That's the mental hospital 
and the prisoner hospital that's over in Hopkinsville. And so he was still in prison when he died there. He was married several times. <clears throat> One of the times that he was he was married, uh, he mentioned on his official report that he was married by William Chapins up on Marvin Creek. There, uh, right on the uh, Wayne County, Mango County line. This is William Chapins also being the Justice of the Peace that we saw on one of the uh, slides earlier. And William Chapins also being some relation to Vice Chapins, also being a, some relation to Don Chapin, a few years into the Penn State Rock Mountain, down in the Battle of Blair Mountain. Also, uh, the uh, county clerk there and one of the attorneys over in Logan County, the John Chapins and John Conley Chapins, also being part of this Chapins family. <clears throat> His military service, he was a Union soldier. He served in the 4th Kentucky Mounted Infantry in Company C, primarily down in the Tennessee, Tennessee, Alabama area there. He was involved in the, uh, in the battles concerning uh, General Hood down around Franklin. Also later on, he was involved in some of the battles with uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest over in Alabama and that area. Saw a lot of, of, a lot of hard action. Bedford Forrest, he was a tough, tough guy, tough, tough commander for the Confederate. <clears throat> he had enlisted early in the war and had served throughout the war. His discharge while he was in uh, Nathan, Georgia, August 17, 1865. <clears throat> Before, before he was involved in the feud there in, in, uh, in Pike County and in Logan County, West Virginia, he was a, a, a deputy sheriff down in, in Perry County, Kentucky. He's considered, in a lot of the records that I've seen, he's been considered one of the, the, the harder cases. The, uh, de the uh, detectives that had called, caught him mentioned that he had had killed over 20 men throughout his career. Now whether that was during the Civil War or while he was deputy sheriff, I, I would kind of tend to think maybe in the Civil War portion that, uh, that he, was, uh, he was involved in the law in, uh, in many ways. <clears throat> he was, he was uh, employed in the Devil Lance's timber operations down on the River. He's one of these guys that Devil Lance had, had, a, uh, had a, a group of men that did a lot of timbering, rolling the logs down to the river and, and that sort of thing. And he, was, he was one of these guys that was involved in that. And he was involved in the shooting of the three McCoy boys. The uh, Elsa Mounts and, uh, and some of the trial for the, the shootings of the three McCoys and the shootings later on in the burning uh, of the cabin, they, they mentioned that, that, uh, that uh, Alexander Messer was the one that went back and, and shot the boy, which wasn't really boy, he was 18 years old. But when they, when they mentioned uh, dead men tell no tells, that was the statement of truth to Alexander Messer when he shot Randolph McCoy, Jr. <clears throat> the thing about Alexander Messer is he was uh, not captured by the Philip by the Phillips uh, posse. He was captured by agents for the Eureka Detective Agency. The Eureka Detective Agency was a detective agency that was located right here in Charleston. Uh, Alpha Burnett was the uh, founder of the uh, of the uh, detective agency. And one of his agents in 1885 that was, that was hired in 1885 was followed by the name of William Baldwin. <clears throat> I mention that because William Baldwin becomes involved in, in some things later on down in, uh, actually his detective agency becomes involved in things later on down in May 1. <clears throat> the, two, the two detectives that capture Alexander Master is uh, Trev Gibson and Ed Cunningham. These are also the two guys that, that had bragged about how they were going to go and capture Big Bad Dead Lands and Cat Hatfield and, and all them. And that was the ones that they caught out in the woods and 
marched them back to Logan County Courthouse and were charged with disturbing their peace. Uh, these two agents, they, they caught, they actually caught uh, Ellison Mounts and, and they also Alexander Messer. They never did catch uh, Dale Wynn's hat, but uh, he, he was a little too slick for him. Who was Ellison Mounts? Ellison Mounts was reportedly the, the uh, illegitimate son of uh, Ellison Hatfield. Chet, to, to clarify a little bit, Ellison Hatfield, I think some of the anger that that Deb Lance and Valentine and, and Eli Stanley may have felt about this. Is Ellison Hatfield, at the time of his death, had several children, young children, and had, his wife had one on the way at the time, so that there was some anger, I'm, I'm sure, probably associated with that portion of it. Here. <coughs> Detective agency, they they were out trying to catch a lot of the half pills and things. So they were they were trying to collect those bounties that were being offered down in the Pike County, Kentucky, for a lot of these guys. <coughs> the uh, the story that we have as far as Alexander Messer being caught was uh, he was down in in Oakley uh, Creek, which probably the Ugly Creek right, right around Chathamville, right in that area. Uh, he had went as far away as he could from the Tug Valley, of course, to try to escape. And some of the, some of the, he you knew they were out after him. But uh, he mentioned to the, to the detectives after they, they had befriended him at a store and he had invited them home and to his home there, and, or to where he was staying at. And, and, uh, well, as soon as they got, when he was putting the stuff up, the two, two detectives, uh, they nabbed him at that point, put handcuffs on him, and he had, his statement to them, according to, to the uh, reports, was, if I had had my guns, you never would have took me alive. Mm -hmm. His trial, was, of course, was in 1889, <clears throat> and he was sentenced to life in prison, as was the other eight men. Now, one of the men during, during these trials for this, Ellison Mounts, was actually hung in Pike. Pike the, the other men were uh, given life sentences. Most of them was paroled at that point. They were paroled 14 or so years later. Most of them was paroled. Of course, uh, Valentine Hatfield had died at that point. And Alexander Messer was also one of these guys that was paroled. Uh, he, Received a parole in about 1903, during that time period. But he couldn't stay out of trouble. He was one of, apparently one of the kind of guys that, that liked to carry a gun and liked to threaten people. And uh, so he ended up, uh, he ended up uh, the parole board, when he went back in front of him, the parole board heard the uh, evidence from the uh, sheriff that had arrested him, said, hey, I've arrested this guy twice for being out and threatening people and wrestling people up. You know, y'all need to do something about him. So they said, we sure will do something about him. So they put him back in prison. And there he remained until he died in 1923. <clears throat> and we'll go ahead and go into a little bit of this part. <coughs> some of those land dealings, some of the timber operations, and some of the court proceedings. If you remember from the movie, and uh, some of the, some of the, uh, as far as Altina Walters uh, book, the the lands of Perry Klein, that lands ended up with five thousand acres of uh, Perry Klein's land. <clears throat> which Deb Lance took uh, Barry Klein to court and uh, <coughs> Deb Lance took Barry Klein to court and when he took him to court he claimed that Barry Klein had been trespassing on his property and cutting his timber. 
Well, at that point, when he took him to court over it, the, uh, the case went, of course, there was, there was a long drawn out process. It wasn't just immediately, you know, here's, here's Perry's uh, land. There was a lot of continuances and things like that. Perry Klein uh, eventually lost his property, and Del Wentz ended up with this uh, 5,000 acres, which when you think of 5,000 acres, probably the best way to think of it is it's, it's almost eight square miles of land. Eight square miles of land that is covered with trees. Well, not small trees, they're large trees. These, uh, of course, at this point, Devil Ants is, is doing a lot of timbering and things. The, uh, his brothers have a lot of land. His cousins have a lot of land. His friends have a lot of land. And a lot of this land is hills and mountains, steep mountains. They can't farm on this land. It's really tough to farm on, on the hillside but it does have all those trees on it. So at that point, Dale Lance goes into business for himself and for his family and cutting timber. <coughs> okay, these timber operations, okay, that's kind of the main, main land dealing. Of course, Dale Lance has also bought other small pieces of property down just south of uh, Maywan, down those areas, but they're, they're kind of small. And later on, as after Dev Lance had bought these, nearly immediately, he sells a 1,500-acre tract to Uncle Jim Vance. That's his uncle. He sells 1,500 acres to uh, Jim Vance. Jim Vance, of course, is working with, with his uh, nephew and cutting the timber and things. And this would be some of the, uh, this is from some of the, uh, the deep books and some of the, uh, the records we have here. And these are some of the lumber companies that were doing business in this area, the Tug Valley area, and some of the land and timber dealers. <coughs> the thing about the timber at this point the NW Railroad has not been built to the Tug Valley, and that wouldn't occur until 1892. Well, from about the end of the Civil War, 1865, up until 1892, you have this timber being rafted out of the Tug Valley. Of course, this is, this is the, the type of timbering operations that would be going on throughout the state of West Virginia until railroads had actually made a headway into the valleys and things. These, uh, this timber, of course, would be cut, cut in the wintertime and things. The families would be out there, the men would be out cutting this timber, getting it down to the, to the, to the river, hauling it down there. Uh, one of the deeds we have is uh, Jim Vance had uh, signed a contract to haul timber for a Lewis Steel. This Lewis Steel was who Deb Vance bought property off of when he decided that the Tug Valley was a little too hot for him. He got rid of his property. Del Wentz got rid of his property in the Tug Valley, moved over on Island Creek from land that he had bought from Lewis Steele. But Lewis Steele had, uh, had contracted with Jim Vance in about 18, 1881 or so, had contracted to cut a bunch of timber for him. <coughs> Jim Vance had agreed to give him a certain amount for the poplar logs, or to give a certain amount for the poplar logs, 10 cents a cubic foot. And Jim Vance, they had agreed that when uh, Jim Vance got him down to uh, Catlettsburg area, the uh, timber brokers or the lumber brokers down there that was buying timber, or these logs for the big sawmills, he would get the best price he could for all the walnut logs. And I'm assuming he did because I never did see any, uh, any suits brought against him. <coughs> As I mentioned, a lot of this logging was done by rafting. The, uh, of course, the Tug Valley, it's a very shallow river. It's, there's not a whole lot of, of water that during the summertime, you know, it's rocks. Knee deep, not very deep at all. They, uh, they, uh, they would wait for the spring tide or the spring flood and all these big rafts. They could float them down to Catlettsburg or down to other 
other sawmills that were located on down by the South Point, down over in, in Ironton, and then on down over into uh, down towards Cincinnati, depending on, on the, uh, the company that bought them. But a company in, in, uh, in, uh, that would have bought a lot of these logs in uh, South Point was a Yellow Poplar Lumber Company. And uh, on down in Ironton would have been the, the Newman Spanner Lumber Company. <clears throat> and of course, the Coleman Crane Lumber Company on down towards Cincinnati. They're buying a tremendous amount of logs, and these logs are huge. They're buying a tremendous amount of them. We can see from uh, some of the newspaper uh, in Lawrence County there, these sawmills were sawing, uh, daily sawing about, about 80,000 uh, worth of lumber, which when you think of as far as the amount of lumber that would be, a semi, a semi that you would see going along Route 64 here, it's going to be hauling about 40 to 50,000 worth of lumber. So that gives you an idea as far as how much lumber they were hauling every day. And this is being hauled by wagons, um, by trains when you get, to, get on over into Ohio there. But this lumber is not being hauled by semis, of course, it's being transported on the Tug River. Uh, the uh, log grass was probably about 100 logs at a time. That's the reason why uh, Del Wayne's hat built many of his crews was he had about 30 guys all together working for him with the figure. So, you know, several of these men are going to be riding these uh, rafts down the Tug River. The Tug River, like I said, is very shallow. So you have to wait for the spring floods to actually start rafting these logs out. Well, there's a few places that I've been down to there, and I, I look at, I, I think back of, of the, of, you know, a 100, 100 log raft. It couldn't be very wide because it's, pretty narrow down through some of those areas with the rocks and things, even when the flood, flood is up. But they couldn't be very long either. So about 100 logs is uh, the Johns Hatfield song about uh, riding uh, 100 uh, yellow poplar logs down the Tug River. Uh, yeah, 100, 100 logs, when you, get, when you get to the mouth of Marble Creek, which I mentioned earlier, there's a sharp bend, and that must have been a headache and a half to go around that bend there. You know, of course, after 1892, the railroad has, has penetrated the Tug Valley. I'll get to the next thing here. Some of the court uh, proceedings that uh, the that Lance was involved in. This is a uh, this particular uh, court case here is, is much like the uh, moonshining or uh, some some sort of maybe trespass type case. The uh, it mentions that uh, Devil Ants was found guilty, and that uh, that Vice Chief Hatfield was not found guilty. They were fined ten bucks, or Devil Ants was fined ten bucks. So he did he did get prosecuted for certain things. Uh, and, The, uh, the next little case I'd like to talk about. <laughs> uh, you notice this lawyer's name again, John S. Markham. There was a case in 1890 that John S. Markham was, uh, was involved in over in uh, Logan County. And Del Lance was called to give testimony. This had been a murder case. A guy had been killed. The body had been hidden. And they, they were having a hard time tracking down who had done it. Well, Del Lance, uh, the uh, Coleman had told in his book when they mentioned what would Del Lance have wanted to have been known for. And uh, Coleman, Coleman said that the greatest bear hunter ever lived. And when you read some of the things that Coleman Hatfield told about this trial, you kind of get that idea that Del Lance was really into bear hunting. And his life kind of revolved around bear hunting. Because as uh, Del Lance is giving this testimony in the court about 
they asked him, okay, why why do you think when you when you track this this out, why why do you think that this was the guy that did it? And why did you go where he did? And when Bill Lentz is describing the uh, said, so, well, you know, I started following his tracks and, and his shoes were making making dents in the dirt and his his shoes were were making ticking marks because the, the shoes had, had uh, hobnails on them. They had little nails that would make make uh, skin marks on like rocks and logs and things like that. And when Devil Ends described them, it was like how a bear claw makes when it jumps up on a log. And then he goes on and, and some of the other testimonies like, well, he was walking along toward such and such place and then like, well, why, why do you think he was walking that way? He said, well, when he spit, you know, it splattered. It splattered a certain way and his, his, uh, his, his shoes were making these marks. And he said, he said the guy was missing a, a nail out of his shoe. He said, right about where the right big toe was. So he, Del Lance was really into the hunting, he was really into tracking and things. <clears throat> well, he was really, as far as woodcraft goes, is if he had been in the time of Danny Payne, he probably had probably been reading a different different history of him rather than the half the only quote of you. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, uh, John John S. Markham makes a comment. He's trying to, uh, to kind of put Devil Lance into his place on his testimony because it's probably damaging his case there a little bit. So he kind of tries to, to put Devil Lance into his place. He he's, uh, makes a statement of, uh, are you a Devil Lance? And uh, Devil Lance makes a statement back. Do I look like I have horns on my head? <laughs> he's kind of kind of being a little cheeky there. And. Uh, you know, are you the are you the, uh, the leader of the feud against the McCoys down in Kentucky? And uh, at this point, Devil Lance makes a statement. Or says, "Are you Soda Head John Markham?" <laughs> of course, Soda Head at that point, you know, when you shake a soda, it just fizzes all over the place. And I think he was kind of referring to, to Soda Head John as he's a, an attorney that you know, just you know, he's pops off and just goes goes all over the place when he starts questioning people. So he's kind of trying, he's kind of turning the tables on the John S. Markham. The, uh, it's, uh, John S. Markham, and the, that case goes on, and, and, and again, so we, we don't really have the end of the case, but we do have the, uh, the part where Doug Lance is kind of putting him in his place. And that may have had a, a an effect later on in some way because the prosecutor against Sid Hatfield at this point or in a later trial for the uh, murder of the Baldwin Belts agents up in uh, Mingo County that prosecutor right there John S. Mm -hmm. so that may you know, he, he knew the Hatfields from a long ways back and and one of the things as far as him going after Sid Hatfield, a little left over in Mossy, maybe. <laughs> oh, is there any questions on anything else? I would be more clear about things than Perry Pine. You say Perry Pine lands. What's the story? Perry Pine's lands. <clears throat> Perry Pine apparently was uh, cutting timber, and uh, Perry Pine's land butted right against the uh, that Lance was laying there, just above the uh, well, grapevine tree. Yeah. Uh, that Lance was probably up one side of the hill, Perry Klein's right up the other side, and most of uh, Grapevine Creek. And Grapevine Creek, about 5,000 acres, so it's about eight, eight square miles of, of property there. And the, the suit ran along the lines of, of uh, Perry Klein had, had whether accidentally or willfully had cut a bunch of the timber that was over on on uh, Lance's property. So at that point, that Lance brought suit against him and to, to collect damages. Well, the men that had had actually had actually uh, uh, backed that Lance on the suit 
Lewis Rutherford, uh, several of the other of the there in, in Logan County, because at that point you had you had to put up a bond when you when you brought suit on something like that, and it was a sizable bond. Well, these men went the bond for Del Lance to go ahead and sue him, and Del Lance was successfully successfully forced uh, Perry Klein to sign the property over to, to him. And at that point, Perry Klein goes over to Kentucky. So you can kind of see that you know, there, there may have been some animosity there. I'm sure there was some animosity there. Um,
when he was captured by uh, Charles Gibson and uh, Ed Cunningham, the they they kind of like well yeah he's he's a little but he he nearly escaped them. He was smart enough to figure out that uh, they shot Charles Gibson in the leg and nearly escaped uh, Ed Cunningham. But as far as you know, him being a little slow and things that. Definition of slow at that point. Nobody even understood the case against him and things. Uh, he, he, he was willing to talk to a prosecuting attorney, uh, Big Ferguson, and things. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering exactly if that was played up just a little bit. What do you know about the attempted arrest of uh, Ephraim Hatfield at his uh, father's house, Thompson Hatfield, by uh, John Rutherford and Harry Watts in 1902? I don't really know. Uh, the, uh, there was some... Uh, just where he shot him? All four of them were killed, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a, I don't really know anything about it, but I just kind of in passing I've seen a little bit on that. And, but these things right after, right at the end of the, uh, you know, the, the feud era, you know, the, any, any time there was, there was any kind of, well, Cap Hatfield, uh, the shootout and the uh, election after, down in Maitland in uh, 1896, 1896. A lot of these, a lot of these, they were frowning upon it because at that point you have Henry Hatfield, who is the nephew of, of uh, Del Wayans and is the son of Eli's. You know, he's starting his political rise here in the state of West Virginia, eventually becoming governor of the state. So they're frowning at that point that the, the Hatfields are saying, "Don't get into trouble. You know, you're starting to affect you know, the younger generation." But yeah, that, that was one thing. The shooting over in, in uh, Wyoming County, um, that, uh, one of the other McCoy sons, which was not, a lot of these shootings were not, not related to the feud or anything like that, but you know, they, were, they were to the point, at that point, they were, you know, don't, don't do things that are, are, are going to cause us trouble. We've already had, had trouble enough at this point. He eventually died of uh, yeah, had a brain tumor and died. It's up in the New York uh, medical treatment. But he was he was pretty old by that time. He yeah. dying of natural causes, like I guess you kinda just described his, his death as uh, that kind of natural cause. He didn't die he didn't die from lead poisoning, so <laughs> <laughs> You go back far enough, probably. And when I say that, I, I think of like where my family lives down in, in uh, Wayne County. I drive up the road, and, and uh, of course, my mother still has a piece of property up in Wayne County. And I, when I drive up the road, I think, man, none of, none of the family owns any of this property, and, and the Markham's had you know, hundreds of acres up in this area. And then I. I start thinking back on the genealogy of these people and it's like, hey wait a minute, there was much of the son of, of the Markham that was granted that property. That's what I am. So their name might be different, it might be Smith or whatever. So yeah. And there is a lot of Hatfields that, that still live down in Logan County, yeah, a lot of dances. Uh, Circuit Clerk and the Logan County is a famous Catholic Clerk. Good girl. She she enabled us to uh, uh, shoot green for a lot of workers to come here to uh, to the uh, archives. How many, how many people were selling food? About about twelve is what we did. Yeah, it, it wasn't it wasn't a, a very large. Most of those casualties were recorded. You could probably be divided into two two sections. You have the, the initial part of uh, the 
three or four boys being executed in August of 1882, and then you had the, the part later on that was probably egged on by, by Perry Klein's rise to power, and, and the Hat was trying, trying to wrongly do something about it, which is it, really not a good thing on my part to, to pass judgment on, on somebody's thinking from back then, but their, uh, their, their response to something that they saw very severely wrong for their family, and as soon as that happened, I think they, they probably <coughs> realized it was extremely severely wrong at that point. Um, there wasn't, as far as, as, as death toll, but it was not, not quite as, like I said, it's not not quite like some of the feuds down in Kentucky, the Breath of County War, uh, various uh, various other feuds, uh, the Harvest, I, I forget all the names of these different feuds, but you know, down in Kentucky you had, had groups of people fighting each other. That was a couple hundred people all together at one time fighting each other. So and some of those feuds down there, this, this feud was a little bit where it was divided by the state line. That that was one thing that, that made it more so as far as, as the feud part of it goes. Was, was Perry Klein related to the boys? Yes, he was. He was married to uh, Randolph uh, the boys. He was he was some close relation to uh, to the McCoy family. Why do you suppose this dear Johnson was more notoriety than the bigger dudes we talked about? The uh, some of the books that was, uh, that was written, uh, <coughs> Crawford's book, uh, the American Vendetta, was uh, one put out. Of course, he was a, a big shot lawyer, a big shot uh, reporter from New York, and the these, this feud was kind of splashed out on the, the national level as far as you know, New York and Chicago and all these newspapers up this and it's like oh look at these two families that are going at each other and, and in a way it's not really families going at each other it's kind of supporters going at each other people with agendas going at each other <laughs> he ended up in prison for a while he, he, uh, he uh, ended up going out west for a while actually kind of follow timber jobs out, out, out further west. He was a skilled timber. He did it all his life, probably. Any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> 